Well, there's not really much left to say about Halo. That hasn't been done in a thousand videos elsewhere, but I love it. And I made a video not too long ago talking about why I love Couch Co-op Halo. And in that video, I kind of made a joke about not really knowing a thing about the story. And I don't think that's strictly true because when Halo came out, I specifically remember on like forums and things like that of the time, people talking about how Halo ripped off the story of Larry Niven's Ringworld. But it was only recently when I started thinking, well, I wonder if that actually holds up. Is Halo a ripoff of Larry Niven's Ringworld? Well, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe and come back. No, no don't, uh, don't worry, I'm, I'm not actually gonna do that. The real answer is that Halo is an amalgam of dozens of different ideas, all lifted from a ton of different science fiction books from the 1970s and 1980s. And ultimately, it is the combination of a load of lived experiences of a load of creators living and working together at Bungie. In the making of this video, I actually reached out to a few of the writers who were involved in Halo, some of whom responded, some of whom didn't, but the ones who did actually gave me some really invaluable insight into the story of Halo and the books which inspired it. So thank you to those and let's get on with the video. And well, you know what, it, it wouldn't hurt you to leave a like with it, come on. Hi, my name is Matty and today I am stoked to talk to you about the books which inspired Halo. The first question you may be asking yourself is, why books? A bunch of stuff probably inspired Halo, so why books? Aside from the fact that I love books, it's really key to remember the time in which Halo was developed. In an IGN article from 2006 called The Influence of Literature and Myth in Video Games, Douglas C. Perry, along with a bunch of other games industry alumni, wrote this gushy think piece which attempted to establish a link between literature and the computer games which were inspired by it. This article features some beautiful writing by Amy Hennig and in it she posits the idea that you can take any computer game and you can trace its thematic roots back to literature. She continues to posit that in fact the reason that literature had such a big influence on computer games is just because there wasn't that much stuff. The explosion of science fiction in popular media hadn't really happened yet. It might be hard for you to imagine a world before the MCU or before Hulu originals, but genuinely, if you were interested in science fiction in the 1990s, you read. It's hard to name a single science fiction author, but Robert Heinlein, Larry Niven, E.E. E. Smith and Orson Scott Card have had a huge influence on the development of the science fiction genre in games, from the first mainframe computer games to Halo. This is actually corroborated by a blog post on the Bungie website from the same year. The post was written by Frank O'Connor and is called The Bungie Guide to Sci-Fi. And in this post, Frankie states openly that Bungie's literary influences were that much stronger, purely because there just weren't that many big sci-fi games or films which could have inspired them. There are literally thousands of books to choose from, and frankly, a few dozen movies. I should use this space to draw attention to the very shallow diversity pool which Bungie had at this time, but I will say, by having this narrower range of influences, this did create a ton more crossover of that Venn diagram of influences. If you read this blog post, then you start to notice the same names are coming up again and again. And this is where you can really start to see those influences beginning to surface. And it makes it much easier for me to claim that Halo is the fruit of a bunch of 20 something year old white American nerds, all making an extension of the things that they love. The way I see it is there are three main elements to the Halo story. You've got a big thing in space built by ancient aliens, you've got a big sexy lad in power armor, and then you've got pew pew pew. We can even break those three themes down further into lots of smaller motifs. The real juice though is how Bungie took all of these tried and tested sci-fi themes to bring you up to speed with the world that they were making. It would be easy to say that the story is pretty thin on the ground in Halo, but what it does really well is getting you up to speed by using all these Reasley 
Mm, easily. Easily is a word now. But what it does do really well is gives you some very quick, easily identifiable silhouettes so that you can figure out where you are, what's going on, and just get into the game really quickly. By pulling on their literary roots, Bungie are conveying maximum information with minimal friction. All of that heavy lifting is done by using all these recognisable totems and themes from a ton of other science fiction. You know that saying, uh, if you steal from one person, then you're a plagiarist, but if you steal from lots of people, then you're a scholar? Yeah, that's pretty much what Bungie were doing here. Over the course of its development, the story for Halo changed quite a lot. It started out as one thing, and it ended up as something completely different, as through its development, it just soaked up more and more influences. And stealing from a bunch of different people is exactly what Bungie were doing. And that's what we're going to take a look at today, so... Let's actually take a look at these books, shall we? Halo's development started in 1997. You may know that it actually started out as a sci-fi RTS game on the Mac. It was all about brave marines on the ground fighting aliens. It's difficult to talk about what the literary influences might have been at this point, but I think a really good starting point would be... Even if you've not read it, you've probably heard of Starship Troopers, right? You've heard of... Rico's Roughnecks! chipping around the galaxy, blasting giant bugs, spaceships, laser guns, the whole shebang. Unlike the film, in the book, the uh, Roughnecks are described as wearing big green suits of exo armor with sensor readouts, so it does feel much more Halo-y when you read it, rather than if you're just going by the film. The first half of the book is all about training. The enemy don't turn up until about the halfway point, and it is not clear at all what they want. And in fact, nobody even asks. Heinlein doesn't seem to think that this is an important point to make in the book. In fact, Heinlein really just uses this book as a vehicle to wax polemic about expansionism, about how the strong will always absorb the weak, about how intergalactic war is therefore inevitable. There's probably about two chapters about shooting bugs, and then the rest of the book is moral panic and proud boy red flags. Heinlein clearly loves and respects the military. This book is filled with such unerring praise for soldiers and such enthusiasm for war. I can't tell if he's ironically critiquing war because his characters just really, really like blowing up foreigners. Hoorah! Eric Troutman told me that Heinlein wasn't really held in that high regard at Bungie, so they would probably try to deny the impact that Starship Troopers had on Halo. But I think the general themes of fighting a relentlessly expansionist villain, uh, the brave marines on the front lines, full suits of armour with sensor arrays and all that kind of thing, doing giant floaty jumps. I think there's a lot here that evidently had some kind of influence, if not directly, then at the very least on the writers who would then go to work on it. Within the first few pages, the Forever War has a really similar setup to Starship Troopers. It's another military sci-fi story about space marines in powered exosuits. It also goes to the lengths of describing the big floaty jumps and so on. So it feels Halo-y out of the gate. But within the first few pages, this book starts to feel like a reaction to, or perhaps even a dialogue with Starship Troopers. Holderman's view of war is completely different to Heinlein's. So in the Forever War, Mandela and his unit are sent all the way across the galaxy to fight against a big army of mushroom men. The thing is, due to the huge distance, Mandela and his team are put into like cryo sleep and they'll wake up when they reach the battlefield. So by the time they've gone into hypersleep, gone to fight the war, gone into hypersleep, then come home again, the society which he left has completely changed. I would say this is a pretty obvious Vietnam analogy. Joe Holderman served in Vietnam and I imagine that experience informed his writing here. It is much more thoughtful and it is a little more critical with its approach to glorifying warfare. There is still a lot of pew 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 though so you know that's always good. And I think the idea of a soldier who's kind of like put to sleep and then wakes up in a different era but the war is still the same, I think that element drips through into Halo as well. Armour is a really esoteric book. It feels like a spiritual successor to Starship Troopers, but 
grittier, more edgy 80s science fiction. And honestly, a lot of the books in this video have that same vibe. Part one of Armour is a single 90 page chapter. It is 90 pages of non-stop frantic war. It is breathless. It is bloody. Nobody seems to know what's going on. Nobody seems to know why this is happening. I was getting real charge of the light brigade vibes, you know. Ours is not to question why. It's just this frantic, frenetic battle. The second half of the book is then partly told through the perspective of people who are watching recordings back of this battle as captured by our kind of protagonist, Felix. It's actually really similar to the main conceit in Halo ODST, and it took me a while for this to click with me and for me to get what was going on. Our actual protagonists are kind of us, and we're living vicariously through Felix. It took me 235 pages, but then when I got it, it was amazing. It is very good, and it clearly had a massive impact on the Halo team. One of the main sources of inspiration was Armour by Robert Stakely, in which a soldier has to constantly relive the same war over and over again. That sense of relentless battle was influential. Armour is also a book which was specifically name dropped by Halo's project lead Jason Jones as directly influencing the tone and the setting of Halo. Halo doesn't dive into the darker and more esoteric themes in Armour, but honestly, that is a good thing. Come 1998, Bungie had now consolidated that their game was in fact going to be a third person shooter and it was going to focus around a super soldier in sweet power armour. When Halo was announced at Macworld in 1999, Master Chief didn't have a name yet. Bungie was still calling him the Cyborg. There was no story at all, but Bungie were figuring out what they wanted to do with regards to the game's tone and the game's character. It's clear, even from this early Macworld demo, that Halo was going to be a story about humans fighting aliens on a big ring in space. This is really where Halo started. Ringworld is the book that started this entire video project. I was hearing about Ringworld all the way back in the year 2000 when people were saying about how Halo was a ripoff of this story. Well, I read it and I found it to be a super enjoyable 70s science fiction story, but it's nothing like Halo. The story is about a ragtag crew of humans and aliens who all jet off into space to explore a giant ring world which has just been discovered. The spaceship then crashes on the ring world and so begins what really could be described as the mysterious island in space. I would say it's not just the whole big ring in space thing that had an impact on Halo. Ring world also features a three-legged bird-like alien and there are three-leg aliens in the Macworld build and there is also a character in here who was chosen specifically for how lucky she is. So there are other themes, other touch points present in Ringworld other than just a big ring in space. The influence of something like Ringworld isn't necessarily in the design. It's in that feeling of being somewhere else, that sense of scale and an epic story going on out there. Ian M. Banks's culture novels are some of those books that all the sci-fi nerds go on about. They're intelligent, they're very, very thoughtful. The Culture as a whole is a series of unconnected novels all set in this distant, post-scarcity, utopian future where the Woke Brigade won. It is literally the future that the left wants. Consider Flebas is set against the backdrop of an interstellar war against the human culture and a relentlessly expansionist race of religiously zealous aliens led by the three-legged Iderans. See these themes crossing over here? The story follows a mercenary who is tasked with tracking down a floating AI construct which has gone mad. There is even a bit where our lead character crashes his ship onto a ring-shaped world. There's even a ring-shaped world on the cover of the book, but in this story our main character gets captured by cannibals and eventually winds up in a space casino. <laughs> yeah. The finale of Consider Flebas takes part on a dead planet down in these ancient catacombs built by a long dead civilization. I can say with all honesty that Ian M. Banks' writing style is just too intelligent for me. 
I also read Use of Weapons, because basically I heard this book had more explosions and more pew pew pews in it, um, but frankly, I struggled with that too. If you're looking for the simplicity of Halo, then this ain't it. But undeniably, the imagination and the storytelling here is absolutely excellent. When Halo was shown at E3 in June 2000, it was still a third-person shooter. One month later, Bungie was acquired by Microsoft and the game switched to a first-person view. Even at this late stage, Bungie still didn't have the Halo story down. Writer Joe Staten stated that the story came together as a collaboration between the whole team. And we've already seen that big list of books that all these guys were vibing on, so we have a pretty clear picture here of how the story of Halo evolved out of that primordial book soup. By the time Halo was announced as a launch title for the Xbox, the story was largely hammered out. If you've managed to get this far in life and didn't know, then the story of Halo centers on an interstellar war between humankind and a federation of ecclesiastical aliens known as the Covenant. While escaping the Covenant, a group of humans, along with their badass super soldier Master Chief, land on a ring-shaped world. It turns out that the Halo is actually an ancient superweapon that was created by a long-dead civilization designed to wipe out a race of parasitic mushroom people called the Flood. That's about as simple as I think I can get. The final piece of the Halo puzzle is Christopher Rowley's Starhammer. Jason Jones again cited Starhammer as an important literary influence on the writing of Halo. The story in Starhammer is about a genetically engineered Superman called John 6725416. The universe of Starhammer is ruled over by the Alien Covenant, so in this, Earth actually lost. John is an escaped slave, and the first kind of third of the book is this kind of meandering, chaotic story of him just going around the galaxy, just like jobbing and doing odd little things here and there. Eventually, he gets a job to assassinate like the head alien. Along the way, he meets a cute flying robot AI companion, and eventually he finds out about a giant super weapon which was built by a race of ancient aliens to destroy a race of parasitic mushroom people. The finale of the story is actually set on this weapon as John works his way through the corridors being assaulted by the parasitic mushroom people themselves. The imagery which inspired Halo is undeniable, but it is really dark. Starhammer is way out there with some of its ideas and some of its themes, but it was a really difficult read. It is at times so overly dark, so overly edgy, so overly grisly. I found it really hard. The book features graphic depictions of murder, torture and rape. It's a really difficult book to read. It goes out of its way to be edgy. Just whether or not it's worth a read, I'll leave up to you. And it actually has a direct sequel. The Vang is a really interesting sequel actually, being that it's set thousands of years after Starhammer, so it has a completely new principal cast. The book is all about the Vang, those evil parasites that were mentioned in the previous book, invading human bodies and, and all the carnage that comes with it. I did actually quite enjoy the sections from the alien perspective because the and the idea of like knowing that they're the bad guys but they're writing their own stories if they're these great heroes and also you know gross monsters like come on that's that's rad the way the aliens are described is fantastic they're so gross shape-shifty aliens that are described as being kind of like slimy worm pine tree flower mushroom monsters with these external organs that flower outwards i mean they're very clearly the inspiration for the flood and the very very colorful bold descriptions is really where christopher rowley's talent as a writer shines through a major influence i know of was a book by christopher rowley called the vang it's about an alien species that was invading and assimilating people. The Vang were basically the Flood. Like Starhammer before it, it is an incredibly bleak and violent book. It's a difficult read. The book is filled with incredibly vibrant and lurid descriptions of mutilation, torture and rape. Just for the sake of shock value. And so again, I'll leave it up to you as to whether that sounds like something you want to read. On Basilisk Station is the first book about Honor Harrington, who is a future space sailor who's just been given her first command in Her Majesty's Royal Space Navy. 
she soon finds herself at the focal point of a giant galactic conspiracy. She doesn't have the resources or the men to be able to deal with this effectively, so it becomes this underdog story which really wouldn't feel out of place in one of those old naval novels like Hornblower or something. You've probably noticed that this is the only book on the list which is actually about a woman. You can tell that this book has a female protagonist is because the author David Webber goes out of his way to keep reminding us about how pretty her eyes are and about how long and silky her hair is and about how nice she smells. But I do like the naval themes, I like the ship descriptions, it feels like the key sections of the Halo game so I do think it would have had a part to play. For additional merit, on Basilisk Station also has exo-armoured marines and lots of other military details which make it feel not just adjacent to Halo but it also gave me like Red October vibes and I would say it feels a little kind of Star Trek-y. Halo 2 was developed in less than a year and would really just continue to borrow from the same literary sources. By the time we got Halo 3, Halo was truly a unique science fiction universe capable of standing on its own. It even kicked off its own EU around this time, all aimed to flesh out the bare bones of the game's initial world building. The Fall of Reach and The Flood were the first two novels released. The Flood is pretty much a blow for blow account of Halo's story, but with a few new bits added in from the Covenant viewpoint, which were actually pretty cool, kind of like the Vang in that respect. And then Fall of Reach is the prequel, which explains the events leading up to the first game. It's not the same story as Halo Reach, but the two do have some areas of similarity. It's basically the story from those Halo animated shorts, if you've ever seen them, you know, about young John Halo going up to battle school, about how lucky he is, how he graduated from the Space Marine Academy. I think there's some throwbacks here to Starship Troopers, but crucially, this book takes a lot of inspiration from Ender's Game. On its best day, Ender's Game is my favourite book. The background to the story is that Earth is at war with a race of ant people. Ender is a very special boy who goes to battle school to learn how to be an officer in the war against the buggers. I really don't want to spoil too much about this book as of all the books on this list, this is the one I would recommend. It is such a fantastic read. It isn't a big guns blazing sci-fi romp that you might expect. What it is, is a story about a compassionate little boy who is taken away from his parents and chosen to become Earth's deadliest warrior. And it is about how much compassion and empathy can you have in order to be a warrior? Should in fact you have any? Is it right to ask a child to get rid of those qualities? This really is a much better version of John Halo's origin story. John and Ender are both selectively bred super soldiers who are capable of incredible feats. The scenes where they both attack senior students, I feel like those two are echoing one another. And then of course there's like flying bug people and stuff, so there are things it has in common, but really it's about silhouettes and recognisable tones. I think Ender's Game is an incredibly special book, and I would recommend it to anybody. And finally, this one might seem like a wild card, but Eric Troutman, who wrote the Halo Bible, told me that he specifically channeled the Marines in Timothy Zahn's Cobra when he created the ODSTs. Cobra is a military science fiction where augmented super soldiers known as the Cobras defend the colonies of man from an alien threat known as the Troft. Johnny Moreau, I mean, come on, seriously, Johnny, Johnny, John, John? <laughs> After a while, it all just kind of blurs into one, doesn't it? Johnny Moreau gets all souped up with cybernetic upgrades and he goes off to war, comes home, society doesn't want him around as a reminder of their past. So far, so forever war. Where Cobra deviates, though, is that the Cobras then go off to a new planet and they end up staging a coup. Citing some of Heinlein's might is right philosophy, they basically just take over a planet. There's some really interesting post-human and political stuff once the book gets here. It would be worth reading just on that basis, were it not for the fact that this is actually one of the only books directly cited by a Halo writer as directly influencing the Halo universe. In order to tell Halo's story effectively, Bungie had pulled 
deep on the roots of the science fiction that they had all grown up reading, painting the broadest and most fundamental brushstrokes, letting the audience's knowledge do the heavy lifting for them. They never need to slow down to explain spaceships or space marines or armoured supermen, because whether you've read these books or not, you're likely to be able to fill those gaps in with just stuff you've experienced elsewhere. This allowed Bungie to establish their world efficiently. Like Jamie Grismer said about Halo's game design, they can do it 30 seconds at a time. The point I've tried to make in this video isn't just that Halo is a computer game that is based on a bunch of old books, but really that as a piece of art, Halo is the culmination of a bunch of shared experiences of a bunch of like-minded, white, 20-something-year-old American men. And I guess that's why books were so rad to me growing up. You know, they were cheap. The minimum specs are pretty agreeable. My friends and I have a load of shared experiences based around the books that we read and that we shared with one another. And I just love the idea of a room full of people just geeking out over the stuff that they love. All these many years later, Halo is now an established science fiction property all of its very own and has then gone on to inspire new things. That's a beautiful thing. Thank you very much for watching this. Half the time when I come up with ideas for videos, it is usually just a way for me to do something that I wanted to do anyway. And for this, it was a great excuse for me to go and read a bunch of books that I'd heard about but had never really got around to reading. So that's great. If you enjoyed this video, then check out some previous uploads of mine. I've got a couple of videos about Halo and I now have more than a couple of videos about books. So guess I'm a booktuber now. <laughs> if you are interested in popular media from the turn of the millennium, then hit that subscribe button and let's get stoked.